You're standing face to face with a woolly mammoth. Six tons of muscle, fur, and fury, tusks longer than you are tall, and you're holding a pointy stick. By every law of nature, by every measure of strength, speed, or natural weaponry, you should be dead in seconds. Yet somehow, against all odds, it was the mammoth that ended up on the dinner menu, not you. This isn't fantasy. This actually happened. For tens of thousands of years, our ancestors, armed with nothing but wood, stone, and raw determination, hunted creatures that would send us running for our cars today. How did a species with no claws, no fangs, and the running speed of a moderately athletic house cat become the most dangerous predator Earth has ever seen? The answer isn't what you'd expect. It's not about strength or savagery. It's about physics, psychology, and the most devastating weapon nature ever created, the human brain working in concert with other human brains. Let's start with the brutal mathematics of the situation. A Colombian mammoth weighed about 12,000 pounds. The average prehistoric human, maybe 150 pounds soaking wet. That's an 80 to one weight disadvantage. Throw in the mammoth's tree trunk legs that could crush a rib cage like stepping on a grape, tusks that could impale you from six feet away, and a thick hide that could turn aside most predator attacks, and you've got what should be an impossible matchup. And mammoths were just the beginning. The Pleistocene world was packed with megafauna that treated the food chain like their personal buffet. Saber-toothed cats with seven-inch fangs designed for one thing, severing spinal cords. Cave bears that stood 11 feet tall on their hind legs, with claws that could disembowel you with a casual swipe. Giant ground sloths, and when I say giant, I mean 20 feet long and weighing four tons, with claws like meat hooks that could reach you from further away than you could reach them. Short-faced bears that could run 40 miles per hour, faster than a horse, while weighing as much as a small car. Meanwhile, what did humans have? Fingernails that break opening a pickle jar, teeth that struggle with beef jerky, a top speed that wouldn't win a race against a chicken. Our skin is so thin that a house cat can draw blood. We're so poorly insulated that we die of hypothermia on a night that a wolf would consider pleasantly cool. We can't see in the dark like cats, can't smell prey like wolves, can't hear like almost any other mammal. Even our birth process seemed designed for maximum vulnerability. Human babies are born essentially premature compared to other mammals, helpless for years while a horse can run within hours of birth. Our heads are so large that childbirth itself is dangerous, and our young require more care for longer than any other species. In a world of super predators, we were walking snacks with daycare needs. On paper, we shouldn't have lasted a week. At a coal mine in Schöningen, Germany, archaeologists uncovered something that rewrote our entire understanding of early human capabilities. Not one, not two, but eight wooden spears, each over six feet long, perfectly balanced like Olympic javelins, and scattered around them, the butchered remains of at least 50 horses. Each spear was carefully shaped from spruce wood, thicker in the front third for weight distribution, tapered at both ends for aerodynamics. Someone understood physics 300 millennia before Newton. The craftsmanship was so sophisticated that modern athletes who tested replicas were amazed at how well they flew. But here's what really sets Schoningen apart, the sheer scale of planning involved. 50 horses represent enough meat to feed a band of humans for months. These ancient humans knew where the horses would be, when they would be there, and exactly how to position themselves for maximum effectiveness. The spears themselves reveal even more. Analysis shows they were made from carefully selected spruce trees, chosen for their straight grain and appropriate density. The wood was worked while green, shaped with stone tools in a process that would have taken hours per spear. This wasn't grabbing a branch in desperation. This was methodical weapon crafting by specialists who knew exactly what they were doing. The wooden spears from Schoningen weren't just hunting tools. They were dual-purpose weapons, equally useful for taking down a horse or defending against a predator that viewed you as a convenient snack. For the first time, we see clear evidence that humans had flipped the script. We weren't just prey anymore, we were becoming predators, and we were just getting started. Fast forward 287,000 years to the American Southwest, where the Clovis people faced an even bigger challenge, mammoths. For decades, archaeologists found these distinctive fluted stone points embedded in mammoth bones and assumed ancient hunters were incredibly brave, or incredibly stupid, throwing spears at charging elephants. Then in 2024, researchers at UC Berkeley, led by Jun Sunseri, tried something different. 
they stopped assuming and started experimenting. Using replica Clovis points, they tested what would actually happen if you tried different hunting methods. Throwing the spears at targets? Possible, but risky, and not very effective against something mammoth-sized. The physics just didn't work. Even the strongest human athlete can only generate so much force with a throw. But then they tried something else, planting the spear in the ground like a pike, angled toward a charging animal. The results were revelatory. A 6-ton mammoth charging at even 15 miles per hour generates 67 times more force than the strongest human could achieve throwing a spear. By simply bracing the weapon and letting physics do the work, hunters could deliver a killing blow deep enough to reach vital organs. The mammoth's own strength became its downfall. This technique had another advantage. It was safer. A hunter throwing a spear has to get within 20 to 30 yards of an angry mammoth. A hunter with a planted spear could position it and then retreat to safety, letting the mammoth's momentum do all the dangerous work. Archaeological evidence supports this planted pike hypothesis. Many Clovis points show impact fractures consistent with massive force, more than any human could generate. Some points are found at angles suggesting they entered from below, not from a throw. At sites across North America, from Blackwater Draw in New Mexico to the Colby Mammoth Kill Site in Wyoming, the evidence points to hunters who understood leverage, momentum, and the deadly mathematics of mass times acceleration. Think about what this means. These hunters weren't just randomly stabbing at mammoths and hoping for the best. They were engineers, calculating angles and force. They were psychologists, predicting where a mammoth would charge. They were strategists, working in teams to funnel these giants toward planted spears. They understood that they didn't need to be stronger than a mammoth, they just needed to be smarter. But perhaps the most shocking revelation from the archaeological record isn't what we hunted, it's who we hunted. For millions of years, big cats sat comfortably atop the food chain, viewing our ancestors as relatively easy prey. The very evolution of our upright stance might have been partly to spot predators in tall grass. Our ancestors' bones bear the tooth marks of ancient cats, testament to millions of years as menu items. Then something changed. Consider what archaeologists found at Atapuerca in Spain. 400,000-year-old remains showing humans had butchered lions. Not scavenged already dead lions, actively butchered fresh kills. The cut marks are in places that only make sense if humans had first access to the carcass. The psychological shift this represents is staggering. Imagine the first human who looked at a saber-toothed cat and thought, I bet that would make a nice coat. That's not normal prey behavior. That's the mindset of an apex predator. It requires not just bravery, but a fundamental reimagining of your place in the world. Evidence from a 300,000-year-old site shows humans not only killed a large scimitar-toothed cat, but carved its humerus into a tool. We'd gone from cowering in trees to wearing our former predators and using their bones as hammers. Some archaeologists believe these predator bones might have held special significance, perhaps as status symbols. After all, anyone can kill a deer. But walking around with a saber-toothed fang necklace? That sends a message. The fossil record reveals something else. By the late Pleistocene, many carnivore species show signs of stress and dietary change. Isotope analysis of saber-toothed bones from La Brea shows they maintained their diet until the very end, but their prey was disappearing. Why? Because humans were hunting the same herbivores, and we were better at it. Here's where human physiology becomes terrifying in its own unique way. We can't sprint like a cheetah, or overpower prey like a lion. But we can do something almost no other predator can. We can run, and run, and keep running until whatever we're chasing simply collapses from exhaustion. The human body is a freak of nature when it comes to endurance. We're basically hairless, covered in millions of sweat glands, more than any other species. Up to 5 million sweat glands cover our bodies, compared to the sparse distribution in other mammals. While a wolf or a big cat overheats after a sustained chase, we just sweat and keep going. Our entire cooling system is essentially a biological radiator that never stops working. Our anatomical adaptations for running go deep. Our Achilles tendons act like springs, storing and releasing energy with each stride. Our large gluteus maximus muscles, the biggest in our body, are perfectly designed for sustained running. The human foot alone has 26 bones working together as a shock absorption system. Our ability to breathe independently of our stride means we never have to stop for air, while quadrupeds must synchronize breathing with their gallop. 
Even our heads are designed for running. The semicircular canals in our inner ears are enlarged compared to other apes, giving us the balance control needed for sustained bipedal motion. We have a special ligament, the Nuchal ligament, that keeps our heavy heads stable while running, something walking apes don't need, but running humans absolutely do. In the Kalahari Desert, anthropologists have documented sand hunters pursuing kudu antelope for hours in the midday heat. The kudu is faster in a sprint, but it can't sweat efficiently through its fur. After two to five hours of steady pursuit, often covering 15 to 25 miles in temperatures exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the animal simply collapses from hyperthermia. Its core temperature rises to fatal levels, while the human hunter maintains a safe body temperature through sweating. The hunters walk up and deliver the killing blow to an animal that can no longer stand. This is horror movie stuff from the prey's perspective. Imagine being chased by something that never stops coming. You sprint away, thinking you've escaped, only to see that strange bipedal figure still following. You run again. It's still there. Hours pass. You're exhausted, overheated, desperate. Your tongue hangs out, your legs shake, your vision blurs from heat exhaustion. And still it comes, relentless as death itself, not even breathing hard. Now, persistence hunting probably wasn't the primary method for taking down mammoths or rhinos, but the endurance that made it possible gave humans another advantage. We could track wounded prey for miles. One spear thrust might not kill a mammoth, but following that bleeding giant for hours or days until weakness set in? That was well within human capability. But the real genius of human hunting wasn't in any individual capability. It was in combination. Tools multiplied our strength. Endurance multiplied our range. But cooperation? That multiplied everything. At Dolny Vjastonice in the Czech Republic, archaeologists found something that perfectly illustrates this. The remains of a 25,000-year-old settlement built literally from the bones of mammoths. Tusks and skulls formed walls. Shoulder blades became roofs, ribs were support beams. The imagery is almost mythological, humans living in houses made from the skeletons of giants they'd slain. The construction itself tells a story. A single mammoth skull can weigh 100 pounds, a tusk might weigh 150. Moving and arranging these bones into stable structures required coordinated effort from dozens of people. But look closer, and you see the real story. The sheer quantity of bones represents dozens, maybe hundreds of successful hunts. One hut alone used the remains of 95 mammoths. The organization required hunting parties, butchering teams, transport crews, construction workers, speaks to a level of cooperation no other predator could match. Fire added another dimension to human hunting supremacy. Controlled use of fire dates back at least 790,000 years, and it changed everything. At night, when most predators held the advantage, humans created circles of light that no saber-tooth or cave bear dared cross. The psychological impact on predators can't be overstated. Fire was completely outside their evolutionary experience. To them, humans were the creatures who commanded the thing that destroyed forests. During hunts, fire became a weapon as sophisticated as any spear. Grassland could be set ablaze to drive herds toward ambush points or over cliffs. Smoke could flush animals from cover or signal distant hunting parties. Fire-hardened wooden spears were stronger and sharper than ordinary wood. Controlled burns could even shape entire landscapes, creating the open grasslands that prey animals preferred, essentially farming the wild herds. And then, somewhere between 15,000 and 35,000 years ago, we achieved something no other species had ever done. We convinced another apex predator to join our team. The domestication of dogs from wolves wasn't just taming, it was recruiting. At Shubeka in Jordan, 11,500-year-old archaeological sites show a sudden spike in hair and small game bones, many showing signs of being digested by canines. Dogs could track what humans couldn't smell, chase what humans couldn't catch, and corner what humans couldn't surround. Together, they formed a hunting unit more effective than either species alone. Cave art from 8,000-9,000 years ago in Saudi Arabia shows dogs on leashes helping humans hunt. Some images even show dogs wearing collars, suggesting sophisticated training and control. The human-dog hunting partnership was so successful that it spread across the globe faster than any previous human innovation. By the end of the Pleistocene, a human hunting party was a terrifying force. Intelligent apes that could run forever, armed with projectile weapons, defended by fire, aided by semi-domesticated wolves, and coordinated by language into perfect tactical units. 
They could hunt by day or night, in forests or grasslands, in heat or cold. They could track prey for days, drive it into traps, or simply outlast it in a marathon of death. No wonder the megafauna didn't stand a chance. And here we reach the darkest chapter of our success story. Humans arrive in Australia around 65,000 years ago. Within 10,000 years, 88% of large mammal species are extinct. The casualty list reads like a monster movie cast. Deprotodon, the giant wombat. Megalania, the giant monitor lizard. Thylacolo, the marsupial lion, and dozens more. Humans reached the Americas around 15,000 years ago. Within 2,000 years, North America loses 72% of its megafauna, South America 83%. Gone are the giant ground sloths, the saber-tooths, the dire wolves, the short-faced bears, and dozens of other species that had thrived for millions of years. The pattern repeats everywhere humans spread. Giant lemurs in Madagascar vanished shortly after human arrival 2,000 years ago. Moa in New Zealand, nine species of giant flightless birds go extinct within centuries of Polynesian settlement. Dwarf elephants on Mediterranean islands, giant tortoises on remote archipelagos, every ecosystem tells the same story. Humans arrive, megafauna disappears. This was an intentional extinction. No prehistoric human set out thinking, let's wipe out all the mammoths. But when you're that effective at hunting, when every successful kill feeds your family and strengthens your tribe, the mathematics become inevitable. A mammoth that takes 22 months to gestate and 15 years to reach breeding age can't reproduce fast enough to offset losses to human hunting, especially when humans preferentially target young adults, the breeding population. Climate change played a role. The end of the Ice Age stressed many populations. But megafauna had survived previous warm periods. They'd weathered dozens of glacial cycles over millions of years. The new variable was us. As researcher Paul Martin put it, we were an invasive species with spears. Every human alive today carries the legacy of those prehistoric victories. Our shoulders are built for throwing, a design that started with hurling stones and spears at distant targets. The human shoulder is unique among primates, with adaptations that allow us to store elastic energy and release it in a whip-like motion. No chimp can throw a fastball. Our brains are wired for teamwork and planning, shaped by millennia of coordinated hunts. The same neural pathways that allowed us to predict where a mammoth would be next Tuesday now help us plan everything from dinner parties to space missions. Even our social structures, the way we naturally form hierarchies, share resources, and teach skills to the next generation, all bear the fingerprints of our hunting past. We carry other inheritances too. That persistence that let us chase antelope to exhaustion shows up in marathon runners who push through pain for hours, in scientists who spend decades on a single problem, in activists who never give up. The pattern recognition that let us track invisible prey through subtle signs helps modern detectives solve crimes and doctors diagnose diseases. The same cognitive abilities that planned mammoth ambushes now plan moon landings and Mars missions. But here's the thing about problem solvers. We can recognize problems and change course. The same intelligence that figured out how to bring down six-ton elephants can figure out how to save them. The cooperation that let us conquer the Pleistocene can help us preserve what's left of the wild. For the first time in our species' history, we have the knowledge to see extinction coming and the power to prevent it. The story of how prehistoric humans beat the monsters isn't just about our past. It's about understanding what we're capable of, for better and worse. Those ancient hunters at Schoningen, planting their spears and waiting for the charge, they weren't so different from us. They looked at an impossible challenge and found a way forward. The question now is, what will we do with the power they pass down to us? Because if there's one thing the fossil record makes clear, it's this. When humans decide to solve a problem, we don't do it halfway. We change the world. Whether that's a promise or a warning depends entirely on what we choose to do next. Our ancestors proved that with nothing but sticks, stones, and cooperation, a weak ape could conquer giants. Imagine what we could do if we turned that same determination toward keeping the remaining giants alive. The mammoth hunters are gone, but their greatest weapon, the human ability to work together toward an impossible goal, remains. Now it's our turn to use it.